language feels so basic to us that we barely ever pay attention to it. But I'd like to show you that just a glimpse of its past will reveal staggering complexity and a rich history. Our words and sentences contain fascinating echoes of worldviews and cultures across time, from modern Britain to ancient history. So let's explore language as a window to the past. We'll look at just how much history is contained in the language we speak today. And then I'll show you one of the most impressive findings of linguistics, how we learned about and reconstructed an entire ancient culture all without any written records, only by looking at language. But let's lay some groundwork first by looking at the history that can be uncovered from the words I'm saying right now, the English language. In fact, imagine you know nothing at all about English history. Imagine you have no access to any records of the past. All you have access to is the modern English spoken today and knowledge of other modern languages. What can English tell you? Well, we can see that French had a large influence on English at some point, since about 30% of our vocabulary is from French. And given the prevalence of government and aristocratic terms like money, state, duchess and prince, we can guess correctly that French speakers were in charge for a while. We can also see that Latin was an important scholarly language since it gives us words like data, ratio and imaginary. But we can also see that English isn't descended from Latin or French because its more basic vocabulary is Germanic in origin. Words like the, you, one, two, and three, really most of our small words. So we see English's roots as a Germanic language. So we can even see this in the differences between the way we speak in formal versus informal settings. We use more words of French and Latin origin in formal contexts. And we have quite a few doublets like these where our more formal or technical word for something comes from Latin or French, where our more basic or less formal word for it comes from Germanic. I'm just giving you the broad strokes here. Each word I say has a huge depth of history behind it, just waiting to be uncovered and learned from. But there's another tool we can use here. How can we pinpoint the date of influence of certain languages on English? The answer, like everything else I've talked about, hides in plain sight. English has changed a lot from the days of Old English, as you know if you've ever tried to read Beowulf. Even Chaucer's Middle English in the Canterbury Tales is pretty hard to understand. But these changes weren't just from outside influences. Left alone, languages will inevitably change over time. We don't notice this since it happens so gradually compared to our lifespans, but the rules of grammar and sound change subtly over generations. And over a thousand years, this can leave a language unrecognizable. And we can use these changes to pinpoint when certain words entered the language. Let's look at the word priest. This was borrowed from Latin, presbyter. But you can see that vowel sound has shifted. F has become E, and in English this word used to be spelled like this. This happened as part of the Great Vowel Shift, which moved a lot of our vowels around, and it happened roughly between 1400 and 1600, and this specific vowel changed before 1500. And it was after this change that the majority of our Latin vocabulary was borrowed. So we can infer that priest was borrowed before the mass borrowing of other Latin words that occurred later. And we can even infer from this that before Latin had a scientific and scholarly influence, it was important to religious practices from an earlier date. And this is true. Our religious words from Latin come from Christian missionaries in the 6th and 7th centuries, which is why they've undergone so many more changes compared to more recent borrowings and are much harder to recognise as coming from Latin. We compare this to a more recent loan word, democratic. This word was borrowed more recently after the Great Vowel Shift, so it hasn't undergone the same shift. F is still F. Finally, since these words describe concepts that aren't universal, not every culture needs a word for them, we can infer that our society has had priests for longer than it's had democracies. 
all this in a simple vowel change. Okay, so this is vaguely interesting, right? Turns out there is a lot of history contained in these words, but what's the point? The scenario of knowing English but having no access to information on its history is absurd. We don't actually learn much from English that we can't get from other sources. And surely if we don't have access to any records, then there's nothing we can know since we don't even have access to a language. So there's one more piece of the puzzle we need. A way to reconstruct languages spoken in the past, stretching back thousands of years. I've already mentioned that English's roots are as a Germanic language. The Germanic family, which includes German, Dutch, Swedish, Danish, and others, are called a family because they share a common ancestor. These were once all the same language. We can see this by comparing some of their vocabulary, choosing words basic enough not to have been borrowed from other sources. Looking at similar correspondences in different words across all of these languages, we can see that they're not only similar, but they're different in predictable ways. And the similarities are far too numerous to be down to simple coincidence or borrowing. And from here, we can even infer regular sound changes that cause these languages to diverge from their ancestor. And we might be able to reconstruct what the word in the ancestor language might have been. And this type of reconstruction is called the comparative method. Linguists put an asterisk there to note that we haven't discovered this word written in any old documents or anything. We've reconstructed it based on everything we know about its descendants. And this method works. If we do this with the modern Romance languages, we get very good guesses for the original Latin word. And we have enough information on the Germanic languages to reconstruct the language that linguists call Proto-Germanic. So can we go back further? If we look at the oldest European languages we have, we see more similarities. And we can even add in some new languages to this group. These might not look that similar, but notice some familiar patterns. Linguists also know what sounds tend to change into other sounds, like k can sometimes become s or h. So we can use that to work backwards. More languages can come in, like the Slavic languages and the Celtic languages, and we can trace all of these languages highlighted on this map back to one common ancestor, Proto-Indo-European. The mainstream guess for when it was spoken is between 4,500 and 2,500 BC. Yes, that's a very long and very rough interval, but we can agree that it's an impressive feat to be able to make guesses about what this ancient language was like when not a word of it was ever written down. We can also try to guess where the speakers might have lived or if any ancient burial sites might have been theirs. Our best guess is here around modern day Ukraine, but some people think it was down here in modern day Turkey. And even though we can try to get some information from archeology, span it's all a bit murky and contentious. But if we want to learn more, we can do exactly what we did to English earlier and look at Proto-Indo-European and see what it can tell us about this ancient language community. They might not have been a single ethnic group, they didn't rule an empire, and we aren't even certain where they lived, but their language still offers glimpses into their way of life and the culture that originated so many that survive today. We do have to be a bit careful here. With prehistory, very little can be known for certain, but what I'll talk about is generally agreed upon. We can start by learning about their technology level based on what words they have. Using the same comparative method from earlier, we can reconstruct these words for field and grain. The H's will look a bit odd here. We know they had a few sounds that were produced somewhere in the back of the throat, but we don't know exactly how they were pronounced, so we mark them with different H's. We also know they had domesticated animals. They had native words for cow, sheep, goat, pig, dog, and importantly, horse, since thanks to their location and timing, it's been suggested that the Proto-Indo-Europeans were the world's first people to domesticate horses. We also know that they had wheels and wagons. Interestingly, this word for wheel comes from their root for to turn, so they derived this word themselves. So this means that either they invented the wheel themselves, 
or whatever culture introduced them to the wheel didn't have much contact with them since they didn't stick around long enough to learn them a word for it. But we can learn about more than just their material culture, we can also learn about their social structures and societies. They had words for servant and different words for various positions of power, including over families, tribes, and in religious practices. Unfortunately, their word for husband was also a word for master, so we know they were very patriarchal. We can also reconstruct some of their kinship terms, and they had words meaning husband's brother and other relatives of the husband, but nothing for wife's brother or anything similar. So in their family structure, marriage meant a woman leaving her family to join her husband's family. And we can reconstruct a word for bride Christ, so we really get a sense of how women were viewed as objects in this culture. On a nicer note, looking at some early poetic texts, we can reconstruct some stock phrases like imperishable fame that would have been used in poetic metre. Lots of the descendant cultures told their myths and stories through epic poems and oral traditions, so the Proto-Indo-Europeans probably did as well. Stock phrases can also tell us a bit about their laws, since legal language is usually very archaic and has to be said in a precise way. They had a couple of different words for types of compensation paid after a crime, and we can see their descendants in legal documents from the Romans to the Hittites, although these would have been enforced socially. The Proto-Indo-Europeans had no writing, so there couldn't have been any courts or written laws. They also saw the law as upholding a kind of cosmic order or harmony, which they had a word for. And this leads us to possibly the most interesting part of all this, how they saw the place of humans in the world. Their word for human literally means earth person, and this word came to mean earth in several daughter languages. So they must have seen humans as essentially earthly. They also used their word for mortal interchangeably with the word human, so they must have seen us as essentially mortal as well. This would have contrasted with something neither earthly nor mortal, so they had gods. From what we can tell about their worship, animal sacrifice played an important role, particularly of cattle, and we can reconstruct quite a few words surrounding the practice. And looking at names of gods in descendant pantheons, we can look at, we can reconstruct the name of one of their most important gods, the Sky Father. This word for the sky often ends up meaning divine in descendant languages, so they must have seen the gods as being inherently celestial in contrast to our earthliness. And it must have made sense for them to have the cosmos ordered with a patriarch at the head, just like their family structures. So language has provided us with a unique and fascinating insight into this culture in a way that archaeology or records of events never could. And since English descends distantly from this ancient tongue, tiny echoes of this still exist in our speech today. However distantly, the past speaks to us. I hope I've shown you that language isn't simple or boring. It's one of the most interesting parts of our lives with such a deep story to tell. Every single language is a unique tapestry of culture and history. Maybe noticing these patterns, like in the comparative method, and what they can tell us could revitalize interest in language education, or at least provide a whole new path to being interested in language, at least it did for me. But for now, I hope you can see that language, in an unseen way, uniquely reflects our culture and way of seeing the world. And just like we learned about the Proto-Indo-Europeans through their language, maybe future historians could do the same to us as well. It can be tempting to view our everyday experiences as default or normal, but that lets so many interesting things in our lives slip unnoticed. And there's no better example of this than the beauty that can be found in language. Thank you.